The following program is brought to you by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries, celebrating 50 years of sharing God's unconditional love and grace. Whatever he teaches on grace, I mean, I, I like everything he, he shares, but his message on grace, his clarity and just down home teaching is what, you know, anybody can understand. That, that's what I love about it. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now Andrew continues teaching from the life-changing Word of God about grace, the power of the gospel. Welcome to our Wednesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. This week I'm teaching through the book of Romans. We started this last Monday. And I tell you, this is powerful. This is the gospel. This is the power of God. And I've got this uh, book and CDs and DVDs and the study guide on this. I tell you, this is just absolutely essential. If Romans isn't one of your favorite books, I mean, if you just don't rejoice when you read the book of Romans, I'm saying this in love, but it's because you are bound by legalism. It's because you don't understand. You are under a performance-based relationship with God. And the book of Romans is Paul's masterpiece that just comes against religious traditions in such a strong way that a lot of people, they just can't understand the book of Romans, and it's because they are steeped in religion. If you persist, if you stick with me through this study as we go through the book of Romans, It'll either make you mad or glad, one of the two. You'll either wind up rejecting it or you'll wind up receiving it and being set free. But you can't go through the book of Romans and be neutral. Man, this is powerful, and it applies to us today. In Paul's system, I've been spending a couple of days here just in the first few uh, verses of the book of Romans. We've spent a lot of time in Romans 1.16 where Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And I've spent quite a bit of time defining terms. The word gospel has become a religious cliche that people just apply to anything that has to do with Christianity. And yet there's a lot of things that isn't the gospel. Telling a people that they're a sinner and that they're going to hell, that's not the gospel. Telling a person that God is angry with you, that's not the gospel. The word gospel means good news, and I believe even more accurately, it means the nearly too good to be true news. It's just over the top good news that God loves you independent of your performance, that you don't have to earn God's favor. It's given to you as a gift. That's the gospel. Now that's good news. That's nearly too good to be true. And most of the church world today is not preaching the gospel. Now, they will refer to the gospel and say they are preaching the gospel, but yet they're just putting people under a guilt and condemnation, feeling unworthy. How could God ever, uh, you know, move in your life because you haven't done this, this, and this? That's not the gospel. When you tie God's love and His performance in your life to your performance, there is no good news in that because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It says that in Romans 3, 23. So Paul is beginning to make some radical statements. I'm not ashamed to tell people about the nearly too good to be true news that God loves them in spite of who they are, not because of who they are. God loves you because He is love, not because you are lovely. You can access everything that God is and has through faith, not through performance. Man, I'm not ashamed to tell people that. That's the power of God, that this understanding that God relates to you by grace through faith. Grace is God's part. He is not holding your sins against you. Faith is your part. And you just humble yourself. And instead of promoting and trusting in your own self-righteousness, you trust in God. That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. By grace are you saved through faith. It's not grace alone. God's grace is the same towards every person on this planet. If it's grace, and the word grace means unearned, undeserved favor, if it's unearned and undeserved, then God is the same towards everybody, whether they are good, bad, or indifferent. 
Grace is extended towards the entire human race, but the reason that it hasn't changed every person is because it's by grace through faith. Faith is our response to God's grace. Now again, faith has been misunderstood and misdefined, and a lot of religious people will say, faith is what I do in order to get God to do something. Faith moves God. That's not true. God moves by grace, independent of you. It's not based on your performance. God moves by grace, and faith is just your positive response to what God has done by grace. Man, that's a mouthful. It took me 20 years to understand and get to where I could say what I just said. Some of you might have missed that, but that's powerful. Faith doesn't move God. Faith only reaches out and appropriates what God has already provided by grace. If God hasn't provided it by grace, you can't make it happen through your faith. And if God has already provided it by grace on an unearned, undeserved uh, basis, then you don't have to earn it. You just humble yourself and receive it as a gift. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. That's the payment of sin. You earned death. You get paid for that. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23, and the wages of that sin is death. You deserve death. I deserve death. But the gift of God is eternal life, not the payment of God, not something that you've earned. No, it's a gift. And this isn't only true about your initial born-again experience. It's also true about your healing, your deliverance, your joy, your peace, your prosperity, and on and on. Everything comes as a grace gift, and you just have to receive it by faith. You can't earn it. And so that, the things that I've just said, that's what releases the power of God in your life for salvation. And salvation is another word that we've turned into a religious cliche, and most people believe salvation. The word saved, salvation, refers only to the initial forgiveness of your sins, what we call being born again. But the word salvation is an all-encompassing word that just refers to everything that Jesus purchased for us. And He purchased your healing and your deliverance and your peace and your joy and your prosperity just as much as He purchased your forgiveness of sins. And so the church has limited salvation to think, well, this is how you get saved. But then once you're saved, now you got to go to church, pay your tithes, live holy, do these things. And maybe you got saved by grace, but boy, you're going to have to earn the blessing of God. Nope. The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. That means that if you got saved by putting faith in God's grace, then that's also how you get healed. That's also how you get prospered. That's also how you have joy and peace. The same way that you receive salvation is the same way you receive everything else. I was raised in a denomination that preached you got saved totally by putting faith in what Jesus did. It wasn't your good works. And we would sing as an invitation, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. And when it came to the initial born again experience, we really emphasized that it was not based on your goodness. If you were good, you still needed to be saved. If you were bad, you needed to be saved. There wasn't a hell number two or a hell number three. All of us had sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we preached that salvation was totally by grace through faith. But as soon as you got saved, now you had to start performing. Yeah, maybe you got saved by grace, but now unless you study the Word, unless you pray, unless you come to church, unless you pay your tithes, unless you start doing all of the things that they told you to do, you couldn't expect God to move in your life. If they would have presented the forgiveness of sins that way, nobody would have ever gotten saved. Because even though we might have done better than somebody else, we still came short. Nobody would have ever have felt like they were worthy to be saved, but we received it as a gift, but everything else had to be purchased by our holiness. That is not what the Word of God teaches. That is not what Paul is teaching here in the book of Romans. It's the gospel 
the unmerited, unearned favor of God available only by faith, not by performance, that releases the power of God for not only the forgiveness of your sins, but for the healing of your body and everything else that you need. Boy, those are radical, radical statements. It was offensive to the Jews of Paul's day because they had been steeped in the Old Testament law. It is offensive to the religious people today because they likewise have embraced and been steeped in the Old Testament law. Sad to say, the modern New Testament, or let me, let me rephrase that, the modern church, not the New Testament church, but the modern church is still steeped in legalism today. It may not be quite as severe as it was with the scribes and the Pharisees where we wear long robes and blow trumpets on the street corner to let people know that we're praying and doing things like that, but we still have a lot of religious Pharisees today. I was one of them. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm not criticizing you if you find yourself in that. But I got born again when I was eight years old, and I mean, I got changed. The next day in school, I remember my friends could tell I was different, and they said, what happened to you? And I said, I got saved. And my friends made fun of me within 24 hours of me being born again. There was enough change that they could see a difference. And so I got truly saved at eight years old, but... I went to church, and I became a religious Pharisee. You know, I'm, I'm now 69. I'm nearly 70, or excuse me, I'm 68. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm nearly 69 years old, and I have never said a word of profanity in my whole life. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've lived a super holy life compared to other people, but who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? I've still sinned. I still come short of the glory of God. Romans 14, 23 says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Man, there's lots of times I haven't operated in faith. I've operated in fear and doubt and unbelief. I've sinned. I've come short of the glory of God. I cannot get anything from God based on my goodness. And I normally wouldn't say this, but I'm, you know, Paul said, that uh, since people were carnal, he'd just get down there and act carnal with them and use carnal reasoning. So that's kind of what I'm doing right here. I wouldn't typically say this, but, but I'm saying that if I have lived a relatively holy life and I hadn't done all of these things, and if I can't get anything by my goodness, then you might as well hang it up. Most of you haven't lived as holy as I have, and if, it isn't, if my holiness isn't making me receive directly from God, well, then you hadn't got a chance. You need to quit trusting in your own self-righteousness and your own self-holiness and instead just believe the gospel, the nearly too good to be true news that God just offers you everything as a free gift. Man, that's awesome. This set me free. And so, like I said, I got born again by grace, but then I went to church. I started getting into this mindset where I thought I was going to earn the favor of God. My dad died just a few uh, weeks after I'd turned um, 12 years old. And he was in the hospital for a number of weeks. I fasted. I prayed for him. But you know what? I didn't see him healed. I didn't see things happen. And the reason is not because God didn't want him healed, my Baptist pastor came over and told me that God needed my dad in heaven more than I needed him. That's not true. This wasn't God that took my dad. My dad was 54 years old. It wasn't God who did that. You know what it was? The reason God didn't move is because he has to flow through people, and I was taught, and everybody around us, my family and all the people in the church were taught that we have to earn God's favor. And we weren't taught that healing was ours. We were taught that God could heal, but it was up to Him. It wasn't part of our salvation. We didn't know the truth. And therefore, we didn't get set free. It wasn't God who caused that. It was me trusting in myself. It was my ignorance. People perish for a lack of knowledge, and I perished. My dad perished for a lack of knowledge. And anyway, I went to church, and I learned all of these wrong things. But then on March the 23rd, 1968, I was in a prayer meeting on a Saturday night. And this will show you how religious I was because at 18 years old, 
on a Saturday night. What I did was meet together with my friends and we would pray from about 10 till midnight. And that's what we did on Saturday night. Instead of going out and running around and doing other stuff, we would pray. And anyway, it's a long story, but God just pulled back a veil and all of a sudden I saw what a religious hypocrite I was. I saw that I was trusting in my own goodness. And I saw that I didn't deserve anything. Prior to that time, I thought I was really good because compared to other people, I was good. Compared to the pastor of the church, I was leading two and three people a week to the Lord. I was living a holy life according to every standard that I knew. But all of a sudden, when God showed up, and I tell you, the glory of God came into this place. We just recently went back there, and we actually filmed some things right there where all of this took place. And uh, the glory of God showed up in that room on a Saturday night, March the 23rd, 1968. And I tell you, when God showed up, when His glory showed up, all of my righteousness was like filthy rags. And man, I turned from self-righteousness and just threw myself on the mercy of God. And I actually thought that God was going to judge me because I saw how unworthy and how unholy I was. But instead of the wrath of God, I got caught up in the, in the love of God, just in the presence of God for four and a half months. I mean, I was literally someplace else. God's love just poured through me. And it was wonderful, but it was confusing because everything I'd ever been taught was you have to earn God's goodness. And instead of being good for the first time in my life, I actually realized how bad I was. And I just couldn't understand what was it that caused God to reveal His love to me the way He did. And it took me a long time to figure out that it was because I finally came to the end of myself. I finally quit trusting in my own goodness and somehow or another thinking, God, now you've got to move because I've done this and this and I'm holy. And once I got out of the way and just threw myself on the mercy of God, that's when the glory of God was poured out. That's when the love of God came in my life. And I tell you, there's people watching this program right now that you know God exists. When I talk about what happened to me, you say, oh, I wished I could have that. Why don't I have the love of God flowing in my life? It's because you're still proclaiming your own goodness. You're still trusting in your own goodness. You haven't understood the gospel, that it's nearly too good to be true news, that it's not what you do for God, it's what Jesus did for you. And that's what releases the power of God unto salvation. In Romans 1, 17, it says, For therein, in the gospel, in this good news that I'm talking about, that it's not based on what you've done, it's based on what Jesus did for you, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. Notice it didn't say, therein is your righteousness revealed. See, the law revealed your righteousness, or more accurately, your lack of righteousness, your lack of being right in, in the things that you're doing. The law focuses on your sin, but the gospel, the good news that God loves you in spite of your failures, in spite of all of your sin, in spite of everything that you've done wrong, the good news reveals the righteousness of God. It points people towards what Jesus did for you. The righteousness of God is Jesus, and it reveals Jesus. It gives Him all of the credit. Here's one of the ways that you can tell, and I'll explain this more when we're into Romans chapter 3, but a person who is under the law will take pride in their goodness, in what they've done. A person who's under grace will give all of the glory to God because even if you're living better than somebody else, if you're living better than you have ever lived before, you're still not worthy. You will give all of the glory to God and you won't be bragging on yourself. If somebody says, man, look at what I've got and I believe for this and I did this and I... And if you are taking credit for everything, you're still under the law. You're a performance. You're taking pride in it. You know, it says over in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 4 and in verse 7, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? You know, this is grace. Any good thing that's in you, 
God did it. Now, you might have cooperated with Him, but I can guarantee you God gets all of the credit. You know, God has been good to me. Jamie and I were so poor that we couldn't pay attention when we first got into the ministry. I mean, literally, we went weeks without eating. We struggled. And yet now, you know, in just the last five years and two or three months, we have spent $75 million on buildings that God has led me to do. And we just acquired a 336-acre property and with a 60,000-square-foot building on it, our total net worth, I'm not even sure, but it's, uh, I don't know, maybe 70, 100 million dollars and things like this. And I mean, what a change. What a change from being where you couldn't even eat to where now we've got all of these things debt free. We haven't gone in debt to do it. But you know what? I can't take credit for this. Now, I have cooperated with God. When God told me to do something, I stepped out, but I can guarantee you, I am not smart enough. Some of you have heard me talk about this, but right before my mother died, which was in 2009, she was 96 years old, she was asking me again to tell her about the ministry and about all the things that God was doing, and I was telling her about all of the Bible schools around the world, the offices we have in different places, and I was just giving a report on all the good things that God has done. And she looked at me, and I mean, she stuck her finger right in my face, and she said, Andy, you know that's God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know that's God. And she says, you aren't smart enough to do that. And I said, absolutely. And you know what? That wasn't offensive to me. Now, a religious person who is sitting here thinking that it's, look what I have done, they would be offended by that because I'm not getting credit. But man, I agreed 100%. I am not smart enough to do what's happening in my life and in my ministry. I can't take credit for it. What do I have that I didn't receive? God gave me everything. See, this is grace. This is the gospel. And a person who understands the gospel, they glory in what Jesus has done. And they glory in the fact that it's not based on their goodness and their wisdom and their great talents and abilities. A person who is so impressed with themselves and is talking about, look what I have done. You do not understand the grace of God. And it's just a matter of time until you fail. If nothing else, old age will catch up with you. And someday you won't be at your peak. And if you're basing everything on what you've done, you're going to come into guilt, condemnation, and failure. I'm telling you, it's the gospel that reveals the righteousness of God. And it's revealed from faith to faith as it is written. This is a quotation from, I believe it's Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. The just shall live by faith. It doesn't say that they vacation there. They spend the weekend there. You live by faith. Not faith in yourself, but faith in what Jesus has done for you. That's the gospel. And it releases the power of God in your life. Gain a greater understanding of what Jesus did for you through God's grace when you get Andrew's teaching on Romans titled, Grace, the Power of the Gospel. It's available in either a CD or a DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. You can also get this teaching as a book or a companion study guide available in either English or Spanish. Each of these valuable resources are available for a gift of any amount. I really recommend that you get this teaching on the grace of God as taught through the Apostle Paul's teaching from the book of Romans. This is powerful. And this book is entitled Grace, the Power of the Gospel. I tell you, if this doesn't light your fire, your wood is wet. This will just be a blessing to you. I also not only have the book, but I have this study guide that is designed to help you teach other people. Once you understand the true gospel of the Lord, you are going to want to share this with somebody else. And then we also have CDs where I taught this and then DVDs that were taken from my television program. I tell you, this would really help you. You don't get this in just one time listening to it. You need to go over and over it, and plus you need to share this with other people. If you'd like a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on Romans, consider Andrew's Life for Today's Study Bible and Commentary, Romans Edition. It includes 470 footnotes that will help you understand God's unconditional love and grace. Or if you prefer, all of these resources are available as part of the Romans Collection. 
It includes your choice of either the CD or DVD album, the book, the study guide, and the Life for Today Study Bible and Commentary, Romans edition. Order the collection today, and while supplies last, you'll also receive a special Andrew Womack Ministries inscribed mug from our store. The Romans collection has a catalog value of $124, but you can receive it today for just $75. The first audio teaching in today's series is available for a gift of any amount when you write or call. We encourage everyone to give, but if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will provide this first CD free of charge. You can order resources or become a Grace Partner through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download many free resources. Or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time. Our helpline number is 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I'd like to ask you to consider becoming a grace partner with us. This is a person that doesn't necessarily get anything back as far as materials for your partnership, but you are just enabling us to reach out and touch other people. And you know, we have just recently had some programs where we're talking about the work that we're doing in Uganda, in Kenya. We have works going all through uh, China, and all over Europe, South Africa, Central America, uh, just all over the world. India, we've got great things going on. And we would really like to encourage you to join with us to become a Grace Partner. And I tell you, not only will you enable us to touch other people's lives, but you'll be blessed. I guarantee you, you cannot outgive God. You will be blessed 100-fold in this life. The message of God's unconditional love and grace is multiplied worldwide through your partnership with Andrew. You can become a Grace Partner today by going to awmi.net or calling 719-635-1111. Be the one. Watch God multiply. God has brought us here to change all of us. Every person here, this is one of the major things you're looking for is change in your life. Changing growing, experiencing the supernatural testimonies of God within your life. Karis has made an enormous impact to me. It has opened up doors that I could have never have opened myself. All of those dreams and desires that you've had in your heart and you can learn how to step out of Karis Bible College and immediately begin your vision or your business or whatever it is you want to do. At this point, and it's only been two years, I can't imagine going through life without this anymore. The greatest thing you will ever do is renew your mind by the Word of God. You're going to get laser focused on your purpose and on your gifts and on your calling, and you're going to go out and change the world. Amen? You can determine your destiny. 